damn late. I had to stop by the wax museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again, you've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. <laughs> well, we ain't killing they army, but well, we killing them. We be on CNN like say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. Hey guys, check it out. I got Eric Margulies on the phone. Um, he's up there in Toronto. And, uh, of course, he's covered, uh, what, 15 wars, something like that. Um, knows everything about everything and was there at the time when it happened. I and don't know anything about sports. Oh, he doesn't know about sports. He knows about everything else. Um, he, he used to drink with Hemingway when he was a kid. And the guy's been everywhere. Listen, so, um, and he wrote War at the Top of the World. And he wrote American Raj, Liberation or Domination, uh, both of which are absolutely essential to your understanding of every single thing. And he writes at ericmargolis.com. That's his website. Spell it like Margolis. Welcome back to the show. How you doing, Eric? I'm alive and kicking, Scott. Great. I'm very happy to hear that. Um, and writing. You write great stuff. Thank you. And top of the season to you, too. Oh, yeah, man. Happy holidays and so Thank forth. You. Yeah. Hey, um... So listen, one of the many things that you know many things about is the nation state of France. I remember for one anecdote of an example in the summer of 2011, you said to me, you said, I just got back from France where all my uh, diplomatic and military and intelligence friends were telling me that they're intervening in Syria, helping the terrorists target the government there. So you know lots of stuff about France. And right now there's uh, all kinds of stuff going on there. So why don't you tell us everything you know about that? Well, France is, uh, France is still boiling. Uh, the problem is uh, the new president, uh, Macron, uh, doesn't command deep respect in France. He's regarded as sort of a young kid without much substance who somehow found himself as president. He has no real political party to back him up. There's great, uh, or there always is great discontent, discontent in France. French are, are notorious grumblers. But uh, what happened was that uh, Macron made the, f the foolish mistake of uh, raising taxes by imposing new taxes on fuel, and particularly diesel, which the French use and love. And uh, this was the straw that broke the French camel's back. There was just general uprising across France. All these people who carry these little yellow security vests in their cars in case the car breaks down, which is a very good idea, uh, put them on and went into the streets. There was horrible rioting in Paris, not from the, uh, the yellow vests, as they were known, but from professional anarchists in their midst who join every riot and start vandalizing and breaking things. It shocked the hell out of France. Uh, Macron uh, finally backed down and rescinded the tax hikes, but he's left looking weak, and his discontent is still boiling. Man, all right, so now throw in sort of uh, right, left, what have you, sort of politics here. Are they more uh, either of those things? Well, interestingly, Macron is called, he wants to be above right-left politics. I mean, he's really like a Hillary Clinton neoliberal type, right? No, he's uh, not entirely, because uh, he used to be a, a, a banker for the Rothschilds. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> so, yeah, well, in the sense that Hillary represents big business and the banks. Uh, yeah, there is a similarity, for sure. But he said that he didn't want right or left anymore. He wanted an independent policy. But what's happened now is he's gotten the right and the left furious at him, and they were rioting with equal gusto. 
Oh, I see. And then, but you say were, I mean, is the whole thing in a lull now, or, or they got most of what they wanted enough? Well, the French riot uh, by schedule. Uh, they're very punctual, and they generally riot only on weekends in this case. And so we'll see what happens this coming weekend. Last weekend, the number of demonstrators were only half of the weekend before. Yeah. Uh, so the demonstrators seem to be losing some of their steam. Uh, the French police have been ordered to crack down harder, and there was a threat that troops might be called into the streets to didn't happen yet, or at least only in a small amount. So uh, right now things are dying down, but something, uh, an incident of some kind, somebody getting run over or hit by a uh, stun grenade or something, could uh, fire the whole thing up again. Man, well, that's interesting. Um, I saw someone was joking around about how Americans were shocked that this would happen since we all know that the French are all just a bunch of uh, cheese-eating surrender monkeys, as Jonah Goldberg plagiarized from The Simpsons, um, and that they have no history of cutting their leaders' heads off there or anything crazy like that. Uh, what do they know about standing up for themselves, the French? This is all very surprising to us. There's great antipathy towards the French, particularly on the on the right wing of the United States, the know-nothing conservatives who have no sense of history uh, love to attack the French. They hate the French because the French make fun of them and because the French are better educated and better mannered, their food is better, and uh, they are more intellectual than some of these yahoos that mock them. Of course, they forget that without French help, the American Revolution would never have occurred. And thanks to Rochambeau and Lafayette, uh, we are not under British control now, thank God. Yeah, well, no, they have forgotten that if they ever knew that, but they do know that we fought two world wars to save them from the Germans, and that's all they need to know. That's right, that's right. Um, even though the first time we saved them from the Germans created the second time we really needed to save them from the Germans first yeah, before they were all right. <laughs> World War I would have ended uh, by negotiations if Woodrow Wilson had not intervened in 1917 and sent a million American troops and that, that overturned the apple cart and uh, guaranteed that World War II would occur. So we have a, we have a very unsavory role in the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. There's a great book uh, by Jim Powell, for people who are not familiar with that argument. Uh, it's called Wilson's War, How Woodrow Wilson's Great Blunder Created Hitler, Stalin, and World War II. And I guess he left out Israel and the British Empire and the Middle East and all these other problems that we've had, too, since then. Um, yeah. Anyways, hey, uh, speaking of Israel and the Middle East and the consequence of World War One and stuff like that, how about this great uh, article that I guess stands alone in all media. I didn't even read about this at Mondo Weiss, and I read them every morning. A big step for greater Israel. The Trump administration quietly changed America's long-held position on Syria's strategic Golan Heights. What's a Golan Heights, Eric Margulies? The Golan Heights are a volcanic plateau that rises up, I don't know how many feet it's high, uh, on the... Um, eastern border of Israel, between Israel and Syria. Uh, it's been Syrian since time immemorial, uh, but it's very strategic because when you sit on top of the heights, as I have, I walk the whole heights, uh, you can look down all over the plain of Galilee, right to the Mediterranean, and if you turn around and look the other way, you can see Damascus. And uh, so it is also the source of about a quarter of Israel's groundwater, uh, that flows down from Mount Hermon uh, in, in on the Israeli on the Syrian Lebanese border. It's, it's high enough to have substantial snow in the winter, so it's very strategic, and uh, it dominates all of southern Lebanon. And uh, the Israelis and Syrians have fought over it a number of times, very violently. Uh, it's a very strategic place, and right now Israeli listening posts on, uh, on top of Golan can uh, listen into people's telephone calls in Damascus. And now the Israelis seized it in '67 when they took the West Bank and Gaza too, right? They did, 
and uh, and though ordered by the UN to return it, uh, they never have. And what happened to the the human beings who owned the property there? They were ousted. They were evicted by the ethnic cleansed by the Israelis. Somewhere between 250 and 500 thousand, as I recall, uh, residents were driven out by the Israelis. The capital of Golan, Kunitra, was leveled by Israeli bulldozers. The Israelis have moved in large numbers of settlers and military positions, and uh, they have virtually annexed it, so they will never give it up, uh, even though the UN has called for them to return it. And just now, the Trump administration rather quietly uh, announced that they were the U.S. would drop its objection to Israeli occupation of Golan and accept it as a piece, another chunk of Greater Israel. Well, and I guess that one's easier because, it, as you said, they finished the ethnic cleansing campaign. Then they did their kind of uh, mini Nakba at the time. So unlike with Gaza and the West Bank. It's already a bunch of Israeli citizens that live there anyway, so it's it's easier to get away with with doing that without causing as much of a controversy because they don't have really anybody to complain except the uh, evil satanic government of Syria and wherever these refugees are, I guess they don't have cameras and microphones in their refugee camps where they live. No, they don't. What's ironic, of course, is that the United States is blasting Russia for having annexed Crimea, it belonged to Crimea belonged to Russia for hundreds of years, uh, and yet it's blasting uh, the uh, accepting the Israeli occupation of Golan without a peep of protest. Yeah, wow. And then, so now, what difference does it really make? Because, as you say, it's been like this for fifty years now. Well, the difference is that uh, Syria refuses to contemplate any kind of peace agreement with Israel uh, until Golan is returned. Mm-hmm. I, this issue has been discussed a number of times, uh, but it, it festers on, and uh, it could spark another war. It certainly, if there's fighting between the two countries, the first place it'll happen will be on Golan. Mm-hmm. And then... But now the Israelis, I mean, hell or high water or whichever negotiations, they're never going to give this up because of the strategic heights, as you're saying. Never, right? never. The water is the most important issue of all. They claim it's for safety and against terrorism, but it's really about uh, water and strategic real estate. Mm-hmm. You know, it's so funny, the double standards here. I was uh, reading up about Iraq War One and about Saddam's different offers to negotiate his way out of Kuwait before the war started and a couple of different times he said yeah so we'll we'll uh, negotiate the end of uh, the Iraqi occupation of Kuwait and he was actually being extremely like reasonable about it uh, too reasonable almost and saying but you promised to hold a conference and resolve the Israeli occupation of Palestine so he wasn't saying as soon as the Israelis get out of Palestine, then I'll get out of Kuwait. He wasn't being that hard about it. But he was saying, look, I'll get out of Kuwait, but you guys have to agree that you're going to do something about the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. And in fact, I think it was in the, the New York Daily News articles about it where they wrote it in such frank language, making the direct comparison, uh, whereas... Almost always, there's such a double standard and such a separate narrative that those things would never be compared with each other at all, um, or anything like that. And in fact, even in the in the article, they said the Israelis insist that the uh, occupation, uh, and they called it that. They didn't say disputed territories, where they that the occupied ter- that the the future of the occupied territories um, cannot be negotiated or dictated from the outside as an internal affair only. So meanwhile, but the context of Iraq and Kuwait is the UN and the new world order and the rule of law and the international coalition and all. It's everybody's business uh, what's going on on the Iraq-Kuwait border. But in the occupation of Israel, the Israelis insist that it's no one else's business, and that's basically good enough for us. That's right, Scott. It's astounding hypocrisy. There's a, a tragic sidebar to this, too. 
uh, Yasser Arafat, the Palestinian leader, uh, when he heard Saddam say this, uh, f- uh, believed it foolishly and came out in support of Saddam Hussein. So the Kuwaitis uh, now, who helped engineer this crisis, turned violently. They had the second, uh, the largest Palestinian diaspora uh, group uh, lived in Kuwait. I think it were 400,000 uh, Palestinians. And in retaliation, expelled them from Kuwait. This was the second biggest expulsion of Palestinians since the Israelis ethnically cleansed them in 1948. Man, um, that's terrible. That footnote's going to have to go in my next book, too. I'm writing, I'm working on the Iraq War I section right now. Oh, congratulations so. to you. Your, your pen moves swiftly. Yeah, well, I won't bore you with the whole story, but I got away with getting the rough draft basically done for me. It's a transcript, but it's going to work, I think, to turn the whole thing into a book. It was a very long-winded speech. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, man. So, yeah, I'm working on that. And, and in fact, fun little uh, side note was um, I saw a clip of Noam Chomsky um, – uh, saying that, you know what, the only good newspaper on Saddam's different peace offers was New York Newsday, and nobody else covered it because they're all evil and work for the man. And uh, so I couldn't find those. So I emailed Noam Chomsky, and I was like, hey, can you help me out with a footnote? And he's like, oh, yeah, chapter six of Deterring Democracy, and also check out my interviews here, here, and here. And and he didn't give me the dates of the Newsday articles, but he gave me the where I could find them for sure. Good and then, Newsday has a very good reputation. Yeah. He's great. Did, yeah, yeah. Well, and Chomsky's great, too. Here he is 90-something years old, and he remembers all his footnotes from 1990. Like, yeah, here's exactly where I, I learned like that, that from. Yeah. I was there in Kuwait, uh, in, in, uh, in Baghdad, during that period, so I remember it vividly, too. Hang on just one sec for me. Guys, you got to check out Mike Swanson's great book, The War State. It's about the rise of the military-industrial complex in America after World War II during the administrations of Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy. And it's a real education. Check it out. The War State by Mike Swanson. And also check out his great investment advice at WallStreetWindow.com. All right. So, you know, I think maybe I should take this occasion to ask you to tell me everything that you know and think about Iraq War I. Well, I have to... Uh, Is that overly back. broad? Um, no. Um, I, I'll, I'll try and condense it as much as possible. There were... No, there no, no. Were, I want the long version. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, here goes. Uh, there were growing tensions between Iraq and Kuwait uh, because Iraq saw itself as the champion of Arab nationalism and it saw Kuwait as a vestige of British and then American colonialism in the Mideast. Uh, Kuwait had been part of Iraq historically, uh, and uh, the British detached it as they did uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi and those places uh, as little separate protectorates that, through which they control oil. Uh, so these were artificial creations with very little uh, historic or nationalist authenticity. Anyway, Saddam now started squabbling with Kuwait uh, about the border, uh, the desert border between them, and about oil because the Kuwaitis began slant drilling and putting pipes in, which was a new novelty then. It's not today, but then they were doing lateral uh, drilling into the Iraqi oil fields and stealing Iraqi oil. It infuriated the Iraqis. So they, uh, there was tremendous squabbling. And to top it all off, the Kuwaitis had loaned Iraq billions of dollars uh, to fight their uh, war against Iran in the 1970s. And um, Am I dates right? I think so, yes. And uh, the uh, all of a sudden the Kuwaitis said, well, give us our money back. And Iraq was still shattered by the war, 
It had lost half a million soldiers. Uh, it was pretty well bankrupt. And now the Kuwaitis were banging on the door for money. So there was terribly bad blood. Um, and the Americans and the British, of course, were supporting the Kuwaitis. And the uh, and things finally came to a head at an Arab Brotherhood peace conference that was held. I, I, I don't remember where it was. I think it was maybe in Saudi Arabia, where the uh, Kuwaiti crown prince who was uh, considered by many to be mentally defective, uh, certainly very unpopular, um, sort of a modern ver uh, a version then of today's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia. He gave a speech uh, denouncing the Iraqis, and he pounded his fist and he said, we'll... He said, "We'll pay the Iraqis. Let the let the Iraqis pay us uh, instead of any money. Let them send their war widows to our harems." Uh, well, this is a huge Arab insult, just huge. You can't imagine how big it was. Uh, and it, when the Iraq, uh, Iraqis heard about this, Saddam uh, blew his top. And to bang this pistol down on the desk and said, invade the bastards, and ordered the Iraqi army to invade Kuwait. And that, to my best of my knowledge, is how that war began. It was not a nefarious plot by Saddam to conquer the whole region or roll on into Saudi Arabia. It was just a real Bedouin Arab uh, tribal rage, raid to avenge a dire insult. Ha, that's so interesting. And all I've read about the beginning of this uh, has never mentioned that. And although I have a couple books on my shelf that I have been meaning to get into, but I've never heard of that before in my life, and I could see how uh, that would play into it. So this was, uh, okay, so I mean, um, in the timeline here, you have the infamous meeting where April Glassby on July 25th told Saddam Hussein, 1990, told Saddam Hussein, oh yeah, I don't know, James Baker told me to tell you, I don't care what you do here, pal. And then you had uh, a couple other State Department flunkies, and even Bush Sr. sent a letter to Saddam that was pretty conciliatory, um, and seemingly was like giving him a, a flashing yellow light to go ahead and invade, so then it's, well, it's a week later, right? Seven days later, on August 2nd, is when... Uh, he launches the invasion. So was this insult in between yes, the 25th yes. and the 2nd? Yes. I see. As far as I'm, I'm doing by memory, uh, it was in between. So he was and already was, rolling tanks near the border and was threatening them and was trying yes, to... He was correct. playing hardball, trying to negotiate, and then they added this insult to injury, and that was the last straw, huh? That, that lit the fuse. Amazing. And there is a, a belief, certainly in the Arab world, that uh, the, the Bush administration uh, lured Saddam into attacking Kuwait. Mm -hmm. The whole thing was planned. They wanted to clip Saddam's wings because the Saudis were getting scared of him. And uh, this is what uh, they did it this way through the April Glass B. Uh, comments about we have no position on Arab border disputes and it was it was either tremendously Machiavellian or it was just a big fat blunder yeah you know I mean and I really want to know that too I've been uh, you know researching that question as best as I can and reading the people who are making those accusations and in fact um, you know Mullah Omar told Arnaud de Bourgrave in the summer of 2001 <laughs> Dear friend of mine, by the way. Oh, Arnold. really? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. oh, I can imagine. Yeah, you guys were buddies cover, covering the 80s jihad against the Soviets yeah. back then. Uh, yeah. So Arnaud, uh, he, and I, I interviewed him one time, by the way, about, oh, I know what it was. It was about Israeli bases in Azerbaijan that they're threatening Iran. He was, a, he was an interesting guy. Um, anyways, um, so Mullah Omar told Arnaud de Bergrav that bin Laden believed that Iraq War I was a setup from beginning to end, that that was part of his whole narrative, uh, that it was just an excuse, I guess from his point of view, to get that foothold or to expand that footprint uh, in Saudi Arabia there. 
and you know That's to right. and, dominate the reason. Mm-hmm. Tom Woods Liberty Classroom. Learn from the greats. Click through from the link in the right hand margin at scotthorton.org. So I'll get a kickback. That's Tom Woods Liberty Classroom. LibertyClassroom.com. All right. So now I talk with Barry Lando. Uh, and I have his book, but I haven't read it yet, but I've read a bunch of his great articles and I, I basically talk with him every January when it's the anniversary of Iraq war one, but I just talked to him a few days ago, you know, with the Bush senior dying as the event to, to go over there. And we talked about this a bit and he said that, and, and I've, I've been reading more and more about this, um, that, uh, Norman Schwarzkopf, the commander of CENTCOM and the CIA as well, according to Lando, were telling the Kuwaitis to take a hard line while the State Department was make, and even the president himself were taking a soft line and leading Saddam to so and leading Saddam to believe that they would not react harshly if he did this. Um, and then so you could say like, I mean, it's pretty obvious it's not a conspiracy theory to say that these guys all sit on the same National Security Council together and that, that ain't even really 3D chess, right? That's just chess to, to you know, get something like that going. So it's not in the realm of crazy or what have you. But then there seems to be like a lot of anecdotal stuff about how, yeah, no, really, James Baker thought it would be perfectly fine if Saddam occupied the northern oil fields. The Kuwaitis were cheating, as you were saying, overproducing from these shared wells and with the horizontal drilling and all this. And so... Go ahead and break their knees. <laughs> That's West Texas rules. Whatever, man, no problem. Uh, and then Bush himself had said, "Well, you know, I don't. We're not going to intervene here, and this kind of thing." And hemmed and hawed for a few days until Margaret Thatcher called him the P word on TV. And so um, that was, the, or I don't know if it was on TV or if it was just in the papers the next day. But um, you know, it seemed like it wasn't until Thatcher really called him out. But that could have been part of the plan too. I don't know. I don't want to put that completely past him, but. I, it, it seems like a, a very obvious prima facie case, as I say that, for, yeah, they set him up. They told the Kuwait, they set the Kuwaitis up, too, for that matter, um, in this thing. But then on the, at the same time, it's just as easy to figure that, well, you're talking about George Bush Sr., who was only like one click smarter than George Bush Jr., and it could be just that they really blew it. And But then, so you're telling me you were there, so... I mean, what did you think at the time? Did you think that they had set him up at the time? Yes. Because, yes, I mean, I they were selling that. him weapons even all through that spring. Yeah, I was very uh, uh, believed that uh, that the crisis had been contrived or fanned uh, by the U.S., which thought that Saddam had gotten too big for his britches, mm-hmm. and he was suddenly a non-responsive Dictator. He was our SOB, but he wasn't taking orders anymore. Saddam had become reckless in defying the United States. He thought he was really much more powerful than he was. He thought he had all the Arab states behind him. Uh, so it was a series of blunders on all sides, as 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 is usually the case in most wars. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's funny because reading about his offers to negotiate. He kept dropping things. I mean, at first he said he wanted to stay in part of the Rumelia oil field, and he wanted to keep this island in the Persian Gulf. And then, nah, forget all that. Just promise that someday you'll negotiate Palestine. And they were like, nope, no deal, no conditions. <laughs> you know. That's right. That's right. And uh, my, I certainly have the view that uh, they they thwarted, they Washington thwarted. Saddam's efforts to pull out from Kuwait uh, because they wanted to see the Iraqis destroyed or at least whittled down to size mm-hmm. and to see their army destroyed. And that would have both gotten Saddam out of the way and would have implanted U.S. power in Saudi Arabia in a much bigger way. And it worked. So it was a Machiavellian plan. Whether it was Jim Baker's plan, he was a very smart man. Uh, or whose plan it was, I don't know, but it worked out, and Saddam fell right into the trap. Yeah. Well, you know, one anecdote, and I, don't, I have no idea how much value to put on this, but I like it, uh, was uh, Richard Clark, the former head of counterterrorism, in his book says that James Baker told him that Bush Sr.'s an idiot, 
and that if it was me, I wouldn't have done that war. And that, of course, he was the Secretary of State who lied us into it at the time. So not like not to let him off the hook or anything. But I like the idea, first of all, of just that he had nothing but disrespect for Bush Sr., who everybody else wants to put on this pedestal, which is understandable when you compare him to his son, the worst person in the world. But, um, but, uh, oh, Trump. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah, I'm still, I'm still Bush Jr.'s worse than Trump so far. And okay. Trump could be much worse, but if you just go by the pile of skulls, so far, uh, even at the rate he's going, Bush was way ahead by this point. You know. Well, I agree. The uh, the long lasting damage from the Iraq invasion will is the is the worst disaster the U.S. has had in foreign policy. It will la- last for decades. Yeah, and maybe forever, right? And this is the thing. In fact, now that we're talking about that, let's talk about that. Um, it seems to me. Like, uh, as I'm saying every day on this show, I'm sure my audience has a high turnover rate because they're sick of hearing me say the same thing here. But that this central policy in American policy in the Middle East is that they're really mad that they overthrew Saddam for the Ayatollah and that they benefited Iran so much. And especially that they stayed, not that they would ever admit it this way to themselves or out loud to us, but they're mad that they stay. Not only did they get rid of Saddam, but they fought a five-year civil war for the Shiite side, which included this massive sectarian cleansing campaign to kick all the Sunnis out of Baghdad and create this new Iraqi Shiite stand that's much closer to Iran than to the U.S. And um, and so that drives them crazy. That's responsible. That's That craziness is why they went on to back the jihadists in Syria to try to bring Iran down a peg there, as Obama said to Jeffrey Goldberg, et cetera. And that's so that's the whole thing is even though it was the bin Ladenites who attacked us, it's Iran that our government hates so much because they're independent from us and they keep benefiting from all of our anti-Iranian activities in the region in every way. But then so um, that's one thing. And I guess I'm interested in what you think about that, that they're like as Seymour Hirsch called it, the redirection, where ever since 06, basically they're trying to make up for 03 through 06. Um, But then, so part of that too, though, is that, for example, the Arabian kings will not stand for the fact that this sectarian cleansing campaign worked and that Baghdad is now a super duper, like 85 or 90 something percent Shiite city. And that the Shiites have, you know, total control over the national government there. And they can't do anything about it. It took the U.S. Army and Marine Corps to make it that way. It took them five years. And so no one can reverse it. But they also absolutely can't stand it. So that's where you get all these quotes from, like, Bandar saying that we can't stand the Shiites. We're going to crush them. And that's why we're doing our jihad in Syria and all this. So back to what you're saying about could last decades. Could last forever. Right? Like... They're never going to uh, be able to accept the fact or do anything about the fact that Baghdad is now a Shiite city forevermore. Well, Scott, we played a major role. We Americans played a major role in stirring up the hatred between the Shia and the Sunni Muslims. Those people lived together for decades, millennia, uh, pretty calmly. And uh, there are a few people like this guy who wrote, uh, he's an Iranian, ethnic Iranian, uh, who wrote this book, I can't remember his name offhand, who, uh, saying that the, you know, the, the, the Shia crescent is coming to threaten the Middle East. That, uh, the, the idea of divide and rule, uh, you know, uh, the old British system, uh, stir up natives, turn them against each other. And that's exactly what happened. But in Iraq is a Humpty Dumpty that is not going to be put together again anytime soon. And it was a disaster, a tragedy, because as I saw myself, Iraq was the most advanced Arab country in socially, in militarily, uh, industrially, educationally. And that's why it was destroyed, because the Israelis considered it a potential threat. Yeah. Um well, so now let's get back to that in just a second, because it's such an important part of it. And I want to go ahead and let you tell that side of the story. But I also want to go back to 1990 for a second here before we get too far away from Iraq War One, um, when 
because you say you were there and I'm not sure if you, I think you said Kuwait, but I think you also I, I told me Baghdad that you were in too. Baghdad, but I, I want to, I was hoping you could give us a timeline of when you got to Kuwait, when you got to Iraq and what you saw there. You've told me before about seeing chemical weapons there. Um, but, uh, I want to hear about all of your story from well, that year. I don't remember the dates when I was there. I'd have to go into my notes. Well, but I mean, you know, you got there just before the invasion or just after or oh, in the fall? The Probably about um, a month before the invasion. And I know everybody was nervous. And uh, I was living on cigarettes and vodka. The journalist died. And by there, you're, you're saying inside Kuwait? In, in, no, in Baghdad. Oh, in Baghdad, okay. Yeah, and we didn't know whether we were going to be attacked from one day to the next by the U.S. Air Force or lynched by the Iraqis. The Iraqi secret police threatened to hang me as an Israeli spy, uh, and uh, which I was not. And uh, <laughs> we were really under very great pressure. Um, and it, it was very tense. I remember we were having lunch in a restaurant, and there was a big bang. Somebody's generator blew up. And everybody stood up and yelled, George Bush, like that. They thought the war had begun. Uh, I came with gold coins sewed in my belt in case we had to walk out. Uh, and they started, you know, killing all foreigners. So it was it was a very tense time. And the, uh, the Iraqis uh, were were digging in, getting ready for war. And then, so at what point were you? Did you stay through for the invasion to report oh, on, or you got no. the hell out of there as soon as you could, or I, what happened I there? Left there about, I think about a week before the uh, bombing campaign began. Wow. So then, at that whole time, you were reporting for the Toronto Sun from yeah. inside Iraq, all during the time between yeah. the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait and the American invasion of Iraq? Yes. Wow. And can I read all that stuff? Sure, I wrote columns at the time. I'm I sure mean, is, I are they all at the Toronto Sun site still? That archive oh, goes back to them? The Toronto Sun was so angry at me for my heresies that I made, uh, particularly about Afghanistan, that uh, they not only ended my column, but they deleted all my columns from their uh, IT systems. Well, so, that, that archive has to exist online somewhere, though. Tell me, please. I don't know where. I've not been able to find it. However, I retain copies of the columns, and I'm having my trusty assistant, Janet, uh, put them back online. I don't know how far she's gotten. Oh, man. Uh, that would be such a treasure. I, I'd love to read that. And now, so then... When you were there, when the secret police weren't accusing you of being an Israeli spy, they were leading you around showing you American chemical weapon supplies? No, I found the, uh, I found the British technicians who were manufacturing chemical and biological weapons for the Iraqis uh -huh. at, at a town called Salman Pak. Uh, I found them while I was interviewing uh, foreign refugees who had been uh, herded into one of the hotels in Baghdad by the Iraqis. Oh, I see. And so these are British contractors that were there, and then they just spilled their guts to you and were like, oh, yeah, we're here yes. making sarin. Yes. They were they were angry <laughs> at the Iraqis and not letting them use their poison gas. And all, uh, and, and talk about hypocrisy. You were the British helping develop, uh, the Iraqis develop chemical weapons for use against the Iranians. Right. As long uh, as it was against Iran, that was kosher. Uh, and we were claiming that the Iraqis were using chemical weapons and nuclear weapons. And it's all a huge pack of lies. And they showed you some of this stuff at the time, too? No, they showed us their notebooks. Oh, I see. Uh, I did not get into the chemical warfare labs in Salman Pak, but they were there. Mm -hmm. Well, so, and you're saying, I mean, you had these two si these two British scientists who contractors who worked on the project, both agreeing oh, yeah. and telling you the story about it. That sounds well reported to me. Yes, man. Um, well, I sure am glad that you have your own copy of that whole archive, and I, I bet you there are like university libraries and stuff that have them somewhere. Uh, well.
Oh, they're there. I can dig them out when you need them. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, go ahead and, and send me PDFs or whatever you got from anything you reported from Iraq during that time. Or or even, I mean, once you got back to, to Canada or wherever you were um, reporting on the war, any of that, I'd love to read every bit of that. Okay. I got to somehow keep this book under 600 pages, but I'm not sure. It's there's Cut so much comma. that's got to go in there, but so much has got to be excluded too. Yeah, no, don't make it too long. People won't read it. No, nah, I won't. It's got to be. It's supposed to be like one good little bit about all of the wars of the 21st century. Well, Carter through now, but but not not overkill on any one of them. I hope. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, my own little version of American Raj, only not as good. <laughs> good luck. Um, yeah. All right, um, so now let's talk about the Likud. Now let's talk about Ariel okay. Sharon and um, and Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, the clean break policy and Iraq War II. You know, I one time read this very uh, interesting thing by J.J. Goldberg at the Forward about how it was really, to say Likud is to oversimplify, it was really the Netanyahu faction and therefore the American neocons who were really so uh, hell-bent on... Iraq War II, whereas Sharon, I guess, was smart enough to see that you're just going to empower Iran. So unless you're promising me you're going to Tehran next, I'm worried about this. Who, But then, of course, ended up getting on board. And as we know from The Guardian, from uh, Julian Borger, or Borger, or Borger, I forget, um, and from Robert Dreyfus in The Nation, that um, Ariel Sharon's office was even manufacturing bogus intelligence in English to stovepipe into the intelligence stream. So... They sure did participate in all of that, but uh, I think a lot of people don't know much about that story and would probably like to hear you tell it. Well, the Israelis were entirely in favor of the war. In fact, they, they helped engineer it. You're not allowed to say that in the American media. Uh, I don't know about the subtleties between Sharon and the rest of the party, but the Israelis regarded Iraq as their principal Arab enemy, because they had emasculated Egypt with the Camp David Accords uh, and uh, Sadat when he was there after him, Mubarak, uh, they took Egypt completely out of the equation. It was a brilliant ploy. The Egyptians were bought off uh, by huge bribes to the uh, Egyptian leadership. And uh, the only Arab country that was left that had any to it was Iraq and then Syria to a lesser degree. So the Israelis were very anxious to destroy Iraq and Syria because that would have eliminated any threat to what they call their eastern border and, and would have left Israel militarily unchallenged in the Arab world. So uh, there was a huge uh, media campaign uh, against Saddam uh, that was in part led by Rupert Murdoch with his people, with all kinds of anti Saddam articles and books and things like that, to which the Kuwaitis gleefully contributed and helped. Um, and the Israelis uh, essentially got America to remove the only Arab country that ever had a hope of developing nuclear weapons. Uh, and that was done very effectively. Iraq was didn't have any nuclear weapons at the time, but it had some industry, some industrial capacity, and that was completely destroyed by the Americans. In fact, we just we were so ruthless in our attacks on Iraq that we uh, destroyed their entire uh, water system in the country, their sanitary sanitary engineering, the sewers, pumping plants, uh, water filtration systems, everything was destroyed. We, we, we bombed Iraq back to a pre-industrial age. Yeah, and that was just Iraq War One, and then they did yeah. it again. Yes, we made the rubble bounce. Uh, yeah. Now, so, and by the way, so I was in ninth grade during Iraq War One, so I was paying a lot of attention, but I did not understand a lot of the deep context of this and that. So I wonder... What all role, I mean, I think it goes without saying, but it shouldn't, and people can read a lot about this, but the neoconservative group, 
was just absolutely at the core of pushing us into Iraq War II. But was it the same case with Iraq War I? Not quite as much. Uh, you had, uh, I call them the, the imperialist camp in Washington. The, a lot of cold warriors and uh, Bushites in Texas, and oil, the oil lobby, which is very powerful. Uh, they, they so the entire there. center, in other words... The Democrats and the Republicans and everyone who works for them. Yeah, they yeah. had their own agenda, yeah. uh, but it wasn't as, as sharply focused as was the the neocon lobby. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the imperial lobby, if you want to call them that, uh, also had thoughts about America's role in the larger Middle East. Yeah. Uh, the neocons didn't. They just wanted to, to destroy the Arabs and be rid of them. Well, I mean, it is true that as ginned up as Iraq War I was, you did have a plainly obvious casus belli there with the invasion of Kuwait. Not that America yeah. had the legal authority to do anything about that. But anyway, um, there at least something had happened. Whereas in Iraq War II, they were basically just saying, hey, you're still mad about 9-11, right? All right, we're going to do one more and just getting away with bloody murder. So. There's a lot more to question, and, and it took a lot more focused effort to push us into that thing, to make it all seem so inevitable that it had to be done at the time. And, Scott, there was another important element, the dog that didn't bark, uh, to quote Sherlock Holmes, the, uh, uh, Russia, and then under Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, gave Washington a green light to go ahead and attack Iraq, right? which had been a major ally for the Russian, a major customer for Russian arms. Importantly, and, they could have voted no on the Security Council, and that would have been a veto. That's right. right. Or the Russians could have sent troops to Iraq or any number of things. But uh, Gorbachev just turned his back and gave the Americans carte blanche, do what you want. Uh, I think that was a terrible mistake by Gorbachev mm. uh, and Russia. Okay, so now when it comes to the neocons pushing us into Iraq War II, um, there are two pretty... I, I kind of, I'm not sure exactly how I break this down, but two major kind of competing theories. One of them is just, yeah, smash, you know, all Arab states and especially Iraq into small pieces as you can, because that's what's good for Israel. And so uh, certainly representing this point, you have uh, this point of view, you have uh, Michael Ledeen saying uh, we must turn the Middle East into a boiling cauldron. And if people read Jonah Goldberg, the uh, editor of the National Review in his article, Baghdad de Lenda Est and Baghdad de Lenda Est Part 2, where he is certainly representing that same view, that Ladinian view, that what we want is total chaos. Now, at the end of that, they said that then everything will work out better, that right now, like he said, it's Humpty Dumpty. You have this 20% Sunni minority sitting on the Kurds and the Shiite supermajority this way, and and you have this artificial Sykes-Pico line and all these things, and that it, it really is a problem, and so we're going to go ahead and shake it all up and and in order to make things you know better i mean they didn't they didn't in other words they weren't even as as violent as their policy they were advocating was they weren't saying it in the most nihilistic way they were saying in order to create a better day someday but then at the same time there's another narrative still was you know neoconservative focused you know wolf of Witsian focused um and even i would say the clean break because I think people throw in the clean break with that first point of view there. But the clean break basically says this is going to be easy. The clean break says, uh, that's David Wormser and Richard Pearl and Douglas Feist signed that, the advice to Netanyahu in 96. And it says, yeah, we'll have a, a Jordanian uh, Hashemite king, maybe the cousin of the current king of Jordan, will come and be the king. And the Shiite supermajority just loves being told what to do by Hashemite kings, man. And so it'll be fine. And then they will put pressure on uh, Syria and on Hezbollah, and they'll, um, you know, uh, help to thwart Iran's ambitions, and they'll build an oil and a water pipeline to Haifa, and it'll be easy. Right, like when Shinseki said, "I'll take three hundred thousand troops." Wolfowitz said, "That's wildly off the mark. We only need, eh, maybe a few tens of thousands, enough to invade, and then psh, it, it's going to be that. fine." So I wonder um, if you think that that was really um, 
kind of a means to an end that they were saying they wanted to really create that chaos. And that was why they dissolved the army. Because their excuse for dissolving the army was like, hey, the Baathist army was horrible. It was Saddam's army of war crimes. Everything. We're starting fresh here. Right, like they, they made it sound like they were just naive and were really doing their best to do their best. And so it, the truth has got to be some of both and in between and what the hell, I don't know. But what do you think? I think so, Scott. It's always a murky line between stupidity and incompetence. Uh, you don't really know. Uh, I think there was And malevolence, for both. that matter, you know. I mean, because if they're outright saying, we just want to create a boiling cauldron and keep it boiling— then that's that evil, was right? That was better for Israel than, uh, you know, a united, powerful Arab countries. The uh, the Israelis had a much sharper understanding of the issue there. The American neocons just believed the propaganda that was circulating around and all the scare stories. And, uh, you know, I, I was there, I remember when they came with uh, claims that uh, Saddam had drones of death that we're going to fly over off uh, Iraqi freighters uh, skulking in the North Atlantic, and we're going to attack sleeping America. It was worthy of these World War II propaganda movies, and uh, a lot of people believed it. I was on. I was a chief CBC Canadian Broadcasting Corporation uh, commentator for for Gulf War II, and uh, I had the uh, mischance the audacity to say on air that the Israelis helped to engineer the war. And I was immediately removed from the station. Yeah. Well, so, that's so, interesting. You know, Colin Delise Rice's uh, deputy, Philip Zelikow, who is really the principal author or overseer of the creation of the 9-11 report and everything, very official guy uh, from inside the National Security Council, said, oh, yeah, the war was for Israel. <laughs> so he's... He's, uh, you know, in competition with you for speaking, uh, frankly. I'm not sure if he was on TV or not. You know, I was reminded the other day, I forget if I said this on the show or somebody was interviewing me or what, but it came up that Tim Russert once asked Richard Pearl on Meet the Press, Hey, Richard Pearl, you guys wrote this thing, A Clean Break, saying to hurt Iran, get rid of Saddam for them? I don't know. Um, So, uh, but... Are you telling me that all your advocacy for Iraq War II now is it doesn't have anything to do with Israel? And Richard Pearl's like, that's right, Tim. It has nothing to do with Israel. And then that was it. Oh, okay. No follow-up question. I mean, at least he brought it up, but... That's right. That's right. Kind well, of funny. after, uh, from Baghdad, I remember writing in my paper that uh, once the U.S. is overthrown... Uh, Saddam, they're going to have to go and find another one. And so far, they haven't succeeded. Yeah. Well, and that was part of the thing, too, right, was Ariel Sharon said, you have to do Syria and Libya and Iran next. And John Bolton said, Syria, Libya, Iran, you're next. And then, so, especially, I mean, I don't know, maybe Gaddafi let you know, more jihadis go to Iraq War II than usual. Uh, the later heroes of America's war in 2011 uh, who went to go fight for uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq and the Sunni insurgency there. But um, certainly the U.S. gave the Iranians every motive in the world to create this massive competition for influence among the Shiite factions and gave Assad every motive in the world to let every right-wing Sunni kook cross the Sykes-Pico line to go help the Sunni insurgency too. That, hey, if we're next, we're going to help keep you busy in the unfortunate country you've already invaded uh, before you add ours to the list, which for the Syrians, you know, only worked for a little while. (laughs) But, uh... You know, so far we haven't invaded Iran, so. So anyway, I guess war with Iran will save for next time, Eric. But uh, thanks very much for coming back on the show. I learned a lot, as always. Let's, uh, we'll keep that in reserve. I'm sure it's going to happen, so uh, just a matter of time. Stay tuned. Oh, man. Uh, I didn't want to hear you say that, but all right. (laughs) The great Eric Margulies, everybody. Thanks again. Working with you, Scott. Uh, You too, man. All right, you guys, ericmargolis.com, spell it like Margolis. And uh, that's the only place that you can read a critical take on uh, 
Trump recognizing Israeli control of the Golan Heights there the way they did and such like that. Hey guys, this is Burden Carr from the Friends Against Government podcast here, and you've probably heard Scott talk about the crowdsourcing effort on Reddit about his upcoming book. All you gotta do to get in is to donate $5 a month to Scott's Patreon and request to join the private Reddit group. In Scott's Reddit group, you will find a pin post outlining the details for how you can help find source material for Scott's upcoming book by listening to archived interviews and taking a few notes. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to either myself, at Birdarchist, or Carr, at CarCampIt on Twitter, and we'll be happy to help. We look forward to seeing you in there. All right, y'all, thanks. Find me at LibertarianInstitute.org, at ScottHorton.org, AntiWar.com, and Reddit.com, slash ScottHortonShow. Oh yeah, and read my book, Fool's Errand, Timed and the War in Afghanistan, at Fool's Errand.us.